Ecclesiastics chapter 3 talks about the seasons under heaven. And these seasons are like experiences you go through in your life from the moment you're born. And all you have to do is identify them and learn the lesson. My time to be born came. You know when those who are parents, you're told, oh, you have a bouncing baby boy, you have a bouncing baby girl, and I was full of life and energy. Then I graduated from university, and it was a time for me to plant my life. And life was exciting. I had a job. I was energetic, I was explorative, I was adventurous, and I enjoyed life to the maximum. Life was on a fast lane. Musha Walami, turn aside, marathoning, dancing all night, beach parties described my life then. But of course, I was managed by the principles of my upbringing to some extent. Then my season to love checked in. And life was in 3D. <laughs> I knew I had hit jackpot. Everything grew to another level. Mwisho Walami became Mwisho Waranawi, as my relatives would say. I experienced Obama's swearing in. I started visiting exotic places. Things like Rhino Charge were very far in my life. <laughs> but it became very common for me. And Anything that I wanted to achieve was not impossible. I had all the support I wanted. My career grew, and it was because of the confidence that the love of my life put in me. November 10th, 2011, was a season I never saw coming. I came from work, walked into the house. As usual, I was like, hey, honey, I'm home. No response. I ran upstairs to the bedroom, checked. Honey was not in bed. Went into the bathroom. Honey was not there. I went back downstairs and walked out of the house and went and asked the guard, where is Annie, as cows would say. <laughs> Annie is in the house. So the guard is so sure Annie is in the house. So as I'm walking back into the house to check, the guard calls me, Raura. Nilikuwa nimeka inje ya garage. Na nilisikia kama vitu zinaanguka huko ndani. Niko na hakika yuko ndani ya nyumba. Hebu ada uangalie. I say okay. So I go in and check. And I'm trying to access the garage from inside the house. I go, I find the door a little ajar and it was not abnormal for Ani to be inside the garage because he used to do his stuff. It was his man room, so he used to do a lot of stuff in there. So I go, I find the jo door a little ajar, I push it further. And my body goes numb. I see a silhouette. 
hanging there. I look again. I'm confused. I walk away. I go to my sister's house next door and start knocking and knocking. And she comes out and asks me, what's wrong? I tell her, I think Steve has taken his life. She asks me, what? And I'm like, I think he's hanging in the garage. And I start crying hysterically. She slaps me. And I look at her, I'm like, I'm the one who's bereaved. <laughs> Why are you slapping me? And she says, are you sure? The doubting Thomas that she is. I figure I better respond before that slap comes again. <laughs> so I nod and say, yes. You see, I had always feared death. It has no warning. It has no shame. It has no preparation. And it is so final. Let me take you back a couple of years on my story with the love of my life. We had been together for seven years and we had only been married for two years when this happened. We loved each other dearly for those seven years. The ladies in the house, have you ever had somebody who calls you every hour on the hour to find out how your day is going? <laughs> the, the, those men sitting next to your ladies, you have a problem. <laughs> Have you ever had somebody find out where your beautician is and pays your bill? <laughs> Have you ever been out having drinks with friends, both guys and girls, and when you ask for the tab, it's been paid? With no drama. This was my life. And so, when I lost the love of my life, I had so many questions. You see, this guy was so organized that he had been planning this thing for a while. He left a note with clear instructions of what he wants done after his passing. Besides that, he left a note to me that said, tell Laura I love her very much and I don't want her to suffer because of my illness. Annie, and this is not a chick, Annie is honey, let's remember that. <laughs> Annie, had been suffering with bipolar for three years. And he was deteriorating at a very fast rate. And did not realize it. So because of the shame of society, we never talked about it. We kept it a secret, and nobody knew what was going on. So we isolated ourselves from all those around us. And obviously, this had an impact to my life. 
my personality changed. I was no longer adventurous. I was no longer social. I was no longer explorative. And I only realized this after Annie went. And I always would ask myself, or ask Annie, what can I do to help? And Annie always said, my love, there's nothing you can do. I have to help myself, and I don't know how. And I cannot tell you how much it hurt so bad. So bad that nobody could do anything to help him. And so, the best I could do was take care of Annie and watch him as he struggled with his life. But the one thing that was different between Annie and I, based on our cultures, was we viewed death very differently. In his culture, you die, and you're interred within maybe five days. On the other hand, in my culture, it is two weeks of drama, <laughs> wailing, celebration of life, and all sorts of things going on. So Annie always used to tell me, Laura, if any of us goes first, and God forbid it is you, by the time your relatives come from Butere Mumias, <laughs> they'll find I'm done. <laughs> so, his note was exactly that. Within three days, his friends, my friends, had to sort him out and close that chapter. And he always would tell me, death is inevitable. I feared it so, so much. And Annie always said, life must go on. So what was the natural thing for me to do? Get on with life. But um, Laura here took her two years to get on with life. Two solid years. So I decided I can't continue living like a zombie. I can't continue living in a confused life. I can't continue living in denial. So the first thing I had to do, as advised by the board meeting of Laura and Raura, was to emotionally let my loved one rest, accept that he's gone, and let him rest. His time to die had come. And I had to let go of my time to weep. So I accepted and let him rest. From a physical perspective, Annie would diligently, every, every year, put things together from the house and drop them at Thomas Bernardo's home. Every year. So I packed his things and dropped them off there. And finally, I moved out of the house. And this was very important because Raura was not sleeping. She was awake all night watching TV, angry, asking, why me? Why me? There were no answers, and there would never be any answers. 
She wouldn't even access certain parts of the house that Annie loved. So it only made sense to move out. So fast forward to now. Eight years later, 10 years this year, from a marriage perspective, I still think about Annie all the time. I dream about him. I celebrate our anniversaries. I laugh at our private jokes. Sometimes I feel like he's in the house and I have a conversation with him like he's there. The thing is, they never go away. But at some point, you have to let them go. And with the decisions that Laura and Laura made, my work in progress started. What bothers me is when I see the stories on suicide in the papers or in the news or on social media, it takes me back to eight years ago. And I ask myself, what can we do to fix this situation? We cannot be having the same thing happening eight years later. So I decided to do my part. And I told my story through Jackson Biko. I decided to share my story because the more we keep quiet about these things that happen, the more we are finding the fuel. We must share so that those signs that are seen, that you notice, we are able to do something about them. So as I shared my story with Jackson, I got a lot of messages. Text, social media, voice calls. And all these people are seeking answers. Imagine I don't have answers. I'm also seeking answers. But for me, my work in progress started when I shared the story. Because my healing starts from sharing the story. But I must tell you, as Bobby Black said, Nairobi is very harsh. I got two specific calls from people apologizing to me. And the reason why they were apologizing was because they had heard stories that I murdered Annie. With all the pain that I was going through, with the way Annie changed my life, I could actually take his life away. So we need to learn how to be sensitive about such things. Some of the messages I received were from people who wanted to take their lives away because of the pain they were going through. And I tried my best to talk them out of it. Some of the messages I got was people leaving as caregivers or taking care of their loved ones who are struggling with personality disorders. Because you see, our society is very, very judgmental. We do not understand personality disorders. We stigmatize those who are struggling with those kind of things. But trust me, it's like a cut. It's like breaking your leg. And it actually manifests physically. So, 
Today is my time to speak, my time to mend, my time to embrace, my time to laugh again. The silence is over. Okay? So as I stand in front of you, I know I'm a special piece of art, still in progress. And one day, maybe it will make sense to me, maybe it will not, but time is a healer, and I am work in progress. Thank you. <laughs>